Guinness. You'd be hard pressed to find any beer drinker in the world who hasn't heard of this popular dry Irish stout. It's one of the most successful beer brands worldwide and has often served, as renowned beer writer Martin Cornell puts it, the gateway to the dark side of beer. But how did this legendary beer brand climb its way to the top? From humble beginnings, we'll take a look at how this world famous stout transformed the flow of beer between England and Ireland and transformed the flow of the beer itself on this episode of Drinking History. Many are familiar with the story of Arthur Guinness and his brewery at St. James Gate in Dublin, Ireland, which he acquired in 1759. I mean, you can get that just from looking at the packaging. And his famous 9,000 year lease. He was definitely not afraid of commitment. But before the birth of the famous Guinness Stout that we are all familiar with, there was the Porter. And then the Porter Stout, and then it was just called Stout. Porters emerged in the early 1700s and while we do lack a lot of concrete evidence to exactly how the porter emerged, there's quite a few theories floating around out there, and this is a topic that is widely debated in the beer world. The main accepted theory is that most likely porters were a mixture of young ale and old stock ale, and that they were drank mainly by the porters who were working in London. So the porter beer of that time is unlike the modern porters that we know today. Most likely, porters back then had a bit of smoky flavor from the direct fire kilning process. It also may have had a little bit of sour flavor from the aging process. And the reason being is that back then, brewers lacked the technologies that we have today that helped modern brewers brew a more consistent product. So it wasn't uncommon for publicans back in the 1700s to mix their beer to taste. This gave them a little bit more consistency and control. Sometimes, instead of wasting bad beer, publicans would just sort of sneak a little bit of that bad beer into the patron's glass. They'll never know, right? These dark brown blends of beer were drank mostly by the working class in London, mainly the porters, which is where the name of the style is derived. We do know that the first record of the term porter being used to describe a beer dates to 1726. So the porter grew in popularity, and in 1776, the first porter arrived to Ireland which is kind of a big moment because it started to get the ball rolling for Guinness. By that time, Arthur Guinness had already been brewing an ale and exporting it to England. He was also the master of the Dublin Corporation of Brewers. But the famous Guinness Stout that we are all familiar with was still quite a ways away. Arthur Guinness got his start in his homeland of County Kildare in Ireland after his godfather, Archbishop Arthur Price, left him an inheritance of 100 pounds. Arthur used that inheritance to start a brewery in Leek Slip, which is just southwest of Dublin. The year was 1755 and Arthur was just about 30 years old. He spent the next five years brewing up a successful business and in 1759 set off for Dublin in search to expand his business. He found himself at St. James Gate at the confluence of the Liffey and River Rye, standing in front of an old rundown brewery. So apparently St. James Street had been abandoned for nine years, and before that it was home to a thriving beer scene until the brewery's former owner, Jean Espina, was thrown from his horse. And according to reports, he suffered a pretty gnarly head injury and died instantly. And it sounds like St. James Street just wasn't the same for a really long time. But here we are with Arthur Guinness with a hope and a dream to revive this disenchanted neighborhood. And on December 31st, 1759, he signed his famous 9,000 year lease for 45 pounds per annum on a four acre brewery site in Dublin and continued brewing his ale there. Meanwhile, the porter was not only growing in popularity in England, but demand was growing in Ireland as well. And you know, Arthur Guinness being a man of opportunity caught wind of this and thought, maybe I should get in on some of that. So just a couple of years after the first porter arrived to Ireland, Arthur began brewing the style as well as his regular ale in 1778. And then in 1799, he began brewing porters exclusively. And he got really good at it. So much so that he had actually reversed the beer trade between England and Ireland. So essentially what Arthur did was he took the porter style of beer that originated in England 
made it his own and then sold it back to England and was so successful at it that more beer was actually being imported into England than England was exporting to Ireland. So obviously, Mr. Arthur Guinness had a talent for making porters. But part of the success and popularity of porter can also be attributed to the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution happened roughly between 1760 and 1840, and it played a key role in the evolution of the porter. Inventions like the hydrometer and the roasting drum and subsequent black patent malt allowed for more control in the brewing process and therefore a more consistent, superior product. Other new technologies like the steam engine, improved transportation, and the modern factory allowed for the commercialization of beer. In fact, Porter was the first beer to be produced on a commercial scale. And as the Porter evolved, it gained widespread popularity. It was a good time to be Guinness. But we're still not quite to the invention of the famous Guinness Stout. Just a couple of years before Arthur passed away at age 78, he left behind the blueprints for the famous Guinness Extra Stout. He brewed a West India Porter, which was a darker, more heavily hopped version of his Plain Porter, which is a beer that eventually would go on to shape the foreign Extra Stout that is now enjoyed all over the world. So Arthur Guinness left his legacy with the West India Porter. So technically, he didn't actually invent the Guinness that we're all familiar with. Sorry. But he was definitely the founding father. In fact, he probably wouldn't even recognize the stout as one of his products. Something worth mentioning, stout back then was a term used to designate a more robust beer that typically had a higher alcohol content versus today, stouts we understand to have a certain color and a certain flavor profile. So a stronger porter would have been called a porter stout and then eventually it was called just stout. So Arthur Guinness left his strongly brewed West India porter and his brewery in Dublin in the hands of his son, Arthur Guinness II, who by 1810 was brewing an ale called Superior Porter. Thinks he can be superior to his dad. It was around this time that the porter really reached its peak in popularity and it started to fall out of favor for stronger, more robust types of porter. So the Guinness Superior Porter was a stronger, or a stouter version of the porter and is sometimes referred to as the single stout. He also brewed an even stronger version called the extra superior porter or the double stout. The extra superior porter was eventually renamed the extra stout and by the 1840s made up a majority of the brewery's production. And it was this beer that really gained traction. The popularity of the extra stout coupled with an industrial revolution and the Guinness family's business acumen propelled the Guinness brand to success. In 1850, Arthur's son, Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, took over brewing operations, and then eventually his son, Edward Cecil Guinness, in 1868. It was from the 1860s onward that these two grew the family business to be the largest brewery in Dublin and eventually the largest beer brand in the world. Over the years, science, experimentation, and innovation combined with clever marketing campaigns like the famous Guinness is good for you and my goodness, my goodness slogans continued pushing the brand forward. In 1959, Guinness launched the first ever nitrogen beer. Nitro beer contains a blend of CO2 and nitrogen bubbles, and it's these tiny little nitrogen bubbles that gives Guinness that famous, characteristically smooth, velvety texture. Mm. It's also what makes a freshly poured pint of cascading Guinness appear to flow backwards. The bubbles seem to float down the glass rather than up it. Although there are now several variations of Guinness, it was this Guinness that was poured out of a nitrogen tap invented 62 years ago that most of us beer drinkers are familiar with today. If you've never had Guinness, it is a dry Irish stout with notes of coffee and chocolate. And for it being a stout, it is pretty low in alcohol. It's flavorful yet still light in body. So it's one of those that you can have definitely have more than one of. So that's the evolution of Guinness in a nutshell, from the porters of the Industrial Revolution to the extra stout to the nitrogen Guinness draft that we are all familiar with today. I'm Amy Beers, thanks for watching, and here is a Guinness toast to good health. Cheers.